that uh, Mr. Adejobi is unable to join. I just called him a while ago and he said he's still at, an, at a place where he cannot immediately leave. And he has sent his apology to other members of the panel. So on that note, I'm going to start immediately because we are already live on Facebook. My name is Ajibola Amzat, and uh, I'm representing the International Center for Investigative Reporting here in Abuja. I see uh, we're a non-profit news agency that seeks to promote transparency and accountability through robust and objective investigative uh, journalism. And once again, I would like to welcome you, Mr. Femi Fadano, senior advocate and lawyers and human rights activist. You're welcome, sir. Thank you very much. I would also like to uh, welcome Ms. Rino Ujuala, the NSAS protesters and an activist. Uh, Rino, you're welcome. Thank you very much. And uh, Honorable Commissioner for Human Rights Police Service Commission, uh, Mr. Romy, you're welcome to this uh, session. Thank you so much. Maybe I'm going to start with uh, Reno. Reno, you are a member of the NSAS and uh, you uh, participated in several uh, protests. And I'd like to understand that the last protest that happened on Saturday, February 13, is connected to the decisions of the panel, uh, judiciary, judicial panel of inquiry in Lagos, that decided that the Lekki Toby should now be open. And uh, some days after, young Nigerians gathered at that uh, Lekki phase, uh, phase one at the, at, 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 the, at the protest ground and they protested. I know that you were not there actually, but uh, what really happened that day? Because I know that many of your colleagues were around. Um, well, many of my colleagues were around and from the um, information gathered from them, some, some people that were arrested were actually passing by the toll gates. It's just not as if they had intent to go and protest at the Becky toll gates. They were passing by and, you know, the spectacle of hundreds of policemen at the toll gates, they're just wondering what's happening. And... It, it, it literally turned out that your stopping at the toll gate alone meant that you're a protester and you should get, you're not even seen protesting. They just throw you into the Black Maria and say you're yeah, under, under arrest for what? For just passing by. And then some protesters, but some protesters actually went to the toll gate. Even before they started protesting, the police had grabbed them and thrown them into the Black Maria or in some cases, LCC enforcement um, security agents would be the one to grab them and throw them into an LCC Black Maria, which is actually quite surprising and shocking because you imagine that as, as the Nigerian constitution, constitution changed, I mean, are people not allowed to protest anymore? And even at that, thrown into the Black Maria in front of the press, in front of journalists, they were taken to over three police stations in Lagos, they were taken to Adeniji, then later transferred to Ikeja, area F, then later transferred to Panti. All these while, all these while lawyers were actually following them up and down. I mean, lawyers, even lawyers from SA and Falano had to literally go there and see what was happening. And while they were in these stations, these people were beaten, they were harassed, they were literally brutalized. And none of them were allowed to see their lawyers until the last moment. And then um, around the evening, a mobile court was haphazardly set up to arrange them on trials of contravening COVID rules. Meanwhile, these people were sanded, I mean, packed into a downfall bus. And you're arranging people for contravening COVID-19 rules and for um, allegedly trying to disturb the peace of the state or, you know, bogus charges which is really really shocking it came as a shock to most of us because i am an NSAS protester you cannot tell me that i cannot protest anytime and anywhere any, any, anywhere i want peacefully this Protesters were not carrying arms they were not seen um, to be acting in a rowdy manner i mean and then to people that thought that the government that actually oh 
there were some part of people like me actually i thought i actually told myself that i think that the government is willing to work you know with the setting up of the judicial panels and so on we think that yes this is ready to listen to our demands but with what happened on october or on, on on saturday rather I do, I do not think that they're willing to work with the demands of the youth but do you think that that particular protest of February 13 was very necessary, considering that uh, the process of uh, seeking uh, uh, justice for the affected owner are still ongoing? Do you think that protest was necessary? Uh, really? Well, the question I should be asking is, who determines what is necessary for peaceful protesters? I mean, you do not dictate for the citizens of a country to say oh this is what is necessary for you to protest about i mean the constitution literally grants us the right to convene anytime and anyhow you want this is a democracy for crying out loud the constitution empowers citizens to protest so i don't think if it's necessary or not the fact that they decided to protest i mean that is enough enough necessity for them to go ahead so it's peaceful it's not disrupting the peace of the states they're not carrying arms What's the harm in the protest for crying out loud? Why is the Nigerian government afraid of protesters that are not carrying arms? This is the question we should be asking ourselves, not if it is necessary to protest. Okay, thank you very much. You know, and now to you, Mr. Father Law, Section 40 of the, I know you have uh, handled a lot of cases regarding the human rights of Nigerians to protest. And of course, you have won uh, some of those cases. And I want to recall uh, section 40 of the Nigerian Constitution that guarantees the right of every Nigerian to assemble freely and associate with other persons. Uh, but section 45 of the Constitution also permits the right to be restricted in the interest of defense, public safety, public order, public morality, public health, and protect the freedom of others. Also, section 8 uh, C of Lagos State in 2020 empowers the governor to order the temporary closure of public place where guarding or persons of call. Do you think the protester broke that law, Mr. Falada? Well, um, thank you very much. My intervention will be very brief. Um, first of all, it has to be realized that Nigerians are not a conquered people. We are a free people. And these are rights that we have won from uh, colonial and local oppressors. Uh, whereas it was illegal to protest or hold a rally without police permit, we have uh, won the battle, legal battle against that uh, provision of the law. As a matter of fact, and coincidentally, It was Jeopardy, the AMPP. Mr. Falano, your voice is fading off. Can anyone hear, hear Mr. Falano speaking? It seems his, his microphone is muted. Probably you're telling him to unmute his mic. Oh, that's true. Yeah, yes, yes, his mic is muted. Okay. Mic is yes. muted again. I have muted myself. Now, I am saying that in before now, you could not protest in Nigeria without a police permit. It was a regulation or a law introduced to Nigeria by the colonial regime. But in 2003, <laughs> at the instance of General Muhammad Buhari, as it then was, and other leaders of the defunct AMPP, I was instructed to challenge that provision of our law. We went to court at uh, uh, what you call pro bono publico, without charging those who briefed us. Uh, we won the case. The case was decided in 2006 where the court held that police permit was illegal and unconstitutional and that therefore Nigerians have the right to protest and the police, Inspector General of Police and his agents were restrained perpetually 
from preventing Nigerians from protesting. The police appeal against the judgment. Again, the police lost in the court of appeal. And that case was decided in December by the court of appeal, December 2008, where the court of appeal said, held that police permit was a relic of colonialism. Based on that, we appeal, I mean, we campaign, and the National Assembly in 2015 agreed that we needed a law to compel the police to protect protesters. And so the Electoral Act was amended in 2015, 27th of March, to, uh, to impose a duty on the police to protect protesters. Last year, uh, the 2020 Police Act, Section 83, Subsection 4, equally provides that during protests or rallies or demonstrations, the police shall provide secu adequate security for the protesters. Unfortunately, unfortunately, that provision was breached by the police. Hence, you had the so-called uh, 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 hoodlums hijacking the protests of last year. But as I've said elsewhere, it was the government that hijacked the protest in the sense that Talks, armed talks were unleashed on peaceful protesters in Lagos and Abuja. In fact, in Abuja, some of the protesters, I mean, some of the thugs were arrested and handed over to the police. But as usual, uh, the police did not charge them. So the point I'm making, therefore, is that you do not need any authorization. If the police wants to hide under Section 45 of the constitution to stop any rally, the police will have to go to court. And I remember an incident in 2007 when Ghana wanted to mark the 50th anniversary of our independence. A group threatened to protest in the stadium where celebrations were going to hold. But the IG had to go to the court. And the court said, I am not going to grant you an order that those who are protesting, those who are saying that Ghana had no independence and therefore there was no basis for celebration, will not be prevented from protesting. What the court will do the court for that break, the court ordered that the protesters crew have their rally in another part of Accra, but not in the stadium where foreign guests were expected. So the point I'm making therefore, instead of threatening on Friday last week, what the Lagos state government ought to have done was to approach the court to say, we do not want the protesters to congregate in around Lekki, Toge, and the government will have to convince the court why that should not happen. But if you read the statement of the general, Attorney General of Lagos State, on like the Commissioner of Police threatening Earl and Bristol, the Attorney General acknowledged and recognized the right of the protesters to hold their rally, but that they should not disturb other road users. But what has caused this problem is the government. Whereas after we have won that battle, General Muhammad Buhari and other leaders of the APC were protesting under the Jonathan regime in Abuja and Lagos. And we, I did impress it on the authorities to prevent peaceful protests from getting violent. You must designate certain areas in each of the states in the country. At that time, protests were allowed in Ojota Ganifa Waimi Park in Lagos, uh, around Faloma in Ikoyi, uh, in Abuja, the fountain, Unity Fountain, beside uh, 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 the uh, Hilton Hotel, Transcorp Hotel. But what has happened? This regime 
whose leaders were beneficiaries of protests in the past, decided to fence off the Unity Fountain in Lagos, decided to fence off the Ganifa Wemi Park. And therefore, people have been forced to protest on the road, on the highways. And we have to learn from what goes on in other parts of the world. In London, there's a place they call Hyde Park. You could go there and abuse the hell out of, I mean, the prime minister, even the queen. But to say in Nigeria, in 2021, that people should protest at the pleasure of the commissioner of police or the governor of a state is totally unacceptable. It's illegal and unconstitutional. You cannot, as President Buhari has repeatedly maintained, that Nigerians have the right to protest. You cannot at the same time turn around and deny them the right to protest. At the point I'm making therefore, the right to freedom of expression guaranteed by section 39, the right to assemble guaranteed by section 40 of the constitution, as well as articles nine and 10 of the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, recognize the right of Nigerians to assemble and protest for or against the government. Now we have even gone beyond that. Having recognized such rights, the law has now imposed a duty on the police during protests to provide security for protesters. If security had been provided last year for the protesters and the protesters were confined to Leki and Ikeja as they did in Lagos, the question of who loves hijacking the protest would not have arisen. But because the police abdicated his duty under the law, statutory duty, and indeed encouraged uh, hoodlums and thugs, and I'm, and I'm thinking of Buja, the old world saw how black jeeps are led to belong to the government or a security agency, ferried armed thugs who shot into crowds and the same vehicles were used to take them away. Up to now, nobody has been charged. Nobody has been taken to court. Finally, in Lagos last week, there was no breach of the peace on Saturday, but there was a breach of the peace on Thursday. When around Obalende, there was a clash between transport unions, uh, two transport unions, the RTN, and the NU RTW. And everybody run, ran at a skirt in Lagos. The people were macheted and injured. And everybody had to run away from that part of the city. It was on radio that people should not drive towards Obalinde. There was total breakdown of law and order. As we are gathered here this afternoon, none of the participants in the actual breakdown of law and order in Lagos have been charged before any court. In fact, yesterday, it was in the papers that the Ministry of Transportation, Lagos State, summoned the leaders of both factions and entered into a peace accord with them. Whereas on Saturday, the protests were not allowed as the young men and women were coming out of their cars, whatever, or walking toward the venue of the protest, they were grabbed. So the question of a breach of the peace didn't occur. Again, uh, as my son was telling me, uh, I think yesterday we were discussing this matter, uh, and I'm talking of uh, Falani, Falano, you know, I mean, who you all regard as, who you all know as past. As a lawyer, he was telling me that. Yes, COVID-19 was breached. Not by the protest, but protesters, but by the government. And I said, how? He said, Lagos allows, the law in Lagos, the regulations in Lagos allow at least 50 people to gather 
once you maintain social distancing and you wear your mask. These guys came with their mask and they were going to have a protest. They were going to observe social distancing. As they were arriving, while they had not congregated yet, the police grabbed each and every one of them, rough handled them, and threw them into a Black Maria. And that it was inside the Black Maria that COVID-19 regulations could be said to have been violated. And of course, for me, there's no way you can fought such argument because we all saw what happened, you know. Uh, and you understand from what uh, uh, Reno has just said and from Macaroni and other, Macaroni and other, uh, uh, other violations took place. You cannot cram people into a black maria uh, where uh, people like Rinu, you know, were not yet born in 1980, when you had the black maria incident, when 70 suspects were put inside the black maria under a scorching sun in Lagos, and they were groaning, crying for help. The police refused to help them. 57 of them were roasted to death. Because of that incident, the use of Black Maria to transport suspects in Lagos was banned. So, I mean, you could see that you cannot put people inside Black Maria and you drive them, you know, into a police detention center and they were uh, almost, I mean, according to them, strip naked, and we saw some of the photographs. That is dehumanizing. That is against the Anti Torture Act of 2017. So, what happened on Saturday was a litany of errors, severe violations of the human rights of the young men and women who were grabbed by the police and who were charged, you know, before the court in the mobile court that day, but from what I've said, the three can charge cannot stand. First and second, breach of the peace. No, no peace was breached. Third one, a breach of COVID-19 regulation that was carried out by the government. And therefore, we'd like to submit that, as I did say, Nigerians are peace-loving people. If the police will be prepared to carry out his duty under mm -hmm. the law, there can be no basis for banning protests in any part of Nigeria. We have no business going to government to take permission. So once the law has said, you don't need permission, the police must sit down with protesters. How can we guide you so that who learns will not hijack your protest, so that you conduct your protest peacefully? And that is what the law has provided for. Until that law is until those laws are amended or repealed, for goodness sake, the right of Nigerians to protest must be respected. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Fano, uh, please, I will first of all ask you to probably provide your video because uh, they would like to see your face as you speak. And before I go to Mr. Robin to speak, I'm going to ask you one quick question, and it's about the state infectious disease law that I cited the other time. The law allows the governor to, you know, um, temporarily, you know, close a particular place, a public place, where guardian or persons or call. Don't you think the governor has a right to do that? And do you not think that the guardian of people violates that law? That the governor has the right to do what? The closure of public space. According oh, no. to Lagos, there is no instrument with which the governor of Lagos closed down lucky for that protest nowhere unless you can show me then it can be challenged because the, the the order of the governor cannot violate the constitutional right of people to protest but i'm saying in this particular instance there was no order there was no notice there was no executive order issued by the governor okay thank you very much like i said we would like to see your face so please you can open all right, your, all right. And uh, um, to you, Mr. Robbie Moore, you are the Commissioner for Human Rights Public, Public Service Commission. And I would like to uh, start by saying that Section 6 uh, B of the Police Service Commission uh, dismiss, give you the power to dismiss and exercise disciplinary control 
over person other than the inspector of general police. Do you think these officers of the NPF have not carried out an operation that should warrant disciplinary action? I'm talking about those ones who carried out the arrest and demonization of uh, protesters on Saturday, February 13th. Oh, well, um, undoubtedly, um, the issue of police discipline is that of the Police Service Commission. Um, but as with everything that is official and, uh, you know, government, so to speak, you need to have some sort of instruments to act on. It could be a petition against certain officers, it could be a letter, it could be whatever. And I think um, there are a lot of layers to, to when the Police Service Commission can, you know, be activated in terms of exercising the powers over police officers as it were. Uh, we need to understand that, yes, the Police Service Commission is not on the street with the, protector, with the protesters. It acts on petitions. It acts on complaints and all of that. And for me, this is where we, there was a gap in terms of identification of those officers and submitting uh, uh, their, their names and actions to the Commission for Discipline. But again, I understand one fact very clearly that the oversight mechanism over the Nigerian police is not that in which Nigerians are well versed with. We, uh, 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 I wouldn't be overstating the fact if I say that for most Nigerians, the existence of the Police Service Commission first came to being to them in the course of the protest. It was then who started, people started saying, oh, if there's a police service commission, why are police officers going rogue? Why are some, why are some police officers not held accountable? And, 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 and all of that. And so for me, we need to retrace a bit. It's about, over, it's, it's about empowering that oversight mechanism to actually oversight the police and begin to you know, discharge its mandate and powers. It is a bit you know, uh, shocking that you have a commission that is supposed to discipline police officers all across Nigeria, from Corona Moda to Rivers to Lagos to in the entire country, 774 local governments. And wait for it. The powers of the Police Service Commission is exclusive. No one can exercise that powers, those powers except it delegates their powers to you. And so you wonder, why would such a commission with enormous powers be situated only in Abuja? When you have the police officers or police force all across Nigeria, why are we not empowering this commission to actually, you know, carry out its mandate? Whether the National Human Rights Commission or the Public Service Commission and all those commissions that, we, that you talk of, their offices are situated across the country. But that which affects Nigerians most, which is the police officers on the street, we, we are happy to have the office only situated in Abuja. And unfortunately, human rights activists, NGOs, such organizations, and all of those persons who could have been the voices in trying to get the Police Service Commission to be taken seriously and situate in the manner that it should be, we are not looking at that. So much money, loads of it, has been poured into police reform, and justifiably so. But not very much has been put into the Police Service Commission, which is an oversight for mechanism or, you know, uh, we, we, we have taken that oversight mechanism for granted. If you have, if you hand, if you hand over someone a gun in a civic space and the accountability mechanism or the monitoring or the oversight is not there, the person naturally after a while with a gun in his hands begins to become a lord by himself and the gun naturally becomes arsenalized. So there is no way we have power is unlimited without oversight mechanism. So for me, those saying uh, the police service commission here and there, we need to step back a bit and you know kind of uh, unpack why this was happening. And the NSAS protest for me 
brought out so much. And what is brought out was that we need to begin to take seriously the issue of oversight. We need to be, begin to take seriously the, 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 uh, the, the, the powers and what the Police Service Commission can do. And that is where government, international bodies and whatsoever should come in with both technical support, resource support and all kinds of support so that we have a Police Service Commission that is across the country, that is quick to react, that is quick to act. You can't have an appearance of a commission and say you do have that commission. So yes, those officers who are there, who have been uh, found guilty should be punished, I agree. But the, 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 the question is the investigating capacity, the, the, the power of the Police Service Commission to, 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 to the, 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 the capacity. I'll tell you something. The, 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 the other time when the presidency set up a, a, a panel to investigate SARS two, three years back, the National Human Rights Commission led that panel. And some officers were kind of uh, uh, identified and the National Human Rights Commission took their names to the presidency. Well, here's the thing. The presidency does not and cannot exercise the exclusive powers given to the commission. So it took another two years for the names to come to the Police Service Commission. I don't think this kind of rigmarole or these layers of bureaucracy will help anybody. I think that the smart thing to do, the smart way to, 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 to enforce citizens' rights and to guide citizens' rights and make the abuse of citizens' rights to demotivate that abuse is to move the oversight mechanism closer. Make it, give it the teeth it deserves. So that as soon as a police officer crosses the line, acts in an unprofessional manner and a report is laid, the police service commission in that state can react. So, but the motivation now is, who is there to even talk about it? How do you get arrest and all of that? So I, 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 I think there are layers and there are bones and joints in all of this. But for me, most critical is the fact that oversight mechanism, accountability mechanism, the discipline of police officers has not been taken seriously. We have focused so much on reform without thinking of accountability. And that is where the gap is. Mr. Mom, let me get, I mean, you need to clarify something for me at this point. I would like to know whose job, whose responsibility is it to make sure that the Police Service Commission do their own job? Whose job is that? I, 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 I this is what, again, we, we, for me, this, this, are my, this are my opinion, Mark you, but I do believe that once upon a time, we had an INEC, an INEC that was rubber stamping voters' uh, uh, results as, as was given to them by those in power. We as citizens engaged government. There was an immense advocacy and government eventually began to give INEC the, 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 the independence it, it needed. And today we have some, some bit of uh, independence and, and INEC can, you know, give results where we even see our opposition winning the presidency from a party in power. So the, 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 the duty is, belongs to you, to me, and to all of us. A good governance is a supply commodity, except there is demand. You can't be given. It's just rest on paper and in statutes and all of that. And so citizens have not taken seriously this oversight mechanism thing. We have not advocated for it, we have not spoken for it, we have not engaged, and we expect that it be, it, 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 it be given. I am not making es any excuses, I'm just being very practical here. That for me, the Police Service Commission has a mandate it should deliver on, but when resources are not allocated for officers across all of the country, how do you expect the Police Service Commission in Abuja to act when police officers misbehave in Karana Moda, in Sokoto, or Rivers, and you have your office just here in Abuja? With a population of just about a hundred plus, and you have a police, you have a police population of about three hundred and twenty-five thousand there about in Nigeria today. Let's look at the practicals of it. So, for me, I think it's not about trading blames now. It's about unpacking where the gaps are and going forward, reflecting on how to plug in those gaps. Thank you very much, Mr. Mo. I really know quickly. I mean, you heard Mr. Mo saying that the police service commission that is responsible to carry out disciplinary action against the police is uh, on its own, being alleged. 
Now, my question to you is, how do you think you and your group should respond to a situation where the police cannot be properly checked? Uh, would you guys consider revising your strategy, knowing that the situation is dire as it is now? Reno, are you there? Can you hear me? I got lost for a moment. Um, You're back now. Did you hear my question? No, no, I didn't. So my question, did you, I mean, you must have heard that Mr. Mom speaking about the inability of the Police Service Commission to properly discipline the Nigerian police as it is now because on its own, it is also incapacitated. And now I'm asking you, what would you suggest should be the response of your group now, knowing that it is not likely that the police can be properly je checked because they would always possibly uh, come for protesters without consequence. Would you suggest a revise or strategy for your group? If Mr. Romi is saying that the police cannot properly be checked in Nigeria, that means that not only the protesters, but as well as the citizens are in a lot of trouble. I mean, I sat at the judicial panel of inquiry for over three months. I saw citizens that were victims of the state. These people were going along their normal day lives. They were struggling to feed with the Nigerian economy with bad health care and all that. And they get shot, they get harassed. Most of them are mentally unstable because of the encounters they've had with these criminals. So if the Police Service Commission is saying that these officers who actually say that they will shoot you and nothing would happen. Mr. Romy's statement is actually confirming that, that we are all in a lot of trouble. So police officers tell us, tell us that they will shoot us and nothing will happen. And that is actually the scenario. And that is what Mr. Romy is confirming right now. So it's not even about the protesters. It's not about the citizens of Nigeria. So we should be afraid of every police officer we come across. We go out there, we are struggling for our daily lives. Like I said earlier, the healthcare system uh, in the country is, is nothing to write about. It's nothing to write about. The, the, there are no good roads, there are no jobs for youth. And we should still be afraid of the people we are paying taxes to to serve us. I think that Mr. Fernando should answer that question because I do not know what to say right now. Okay. Mr. Fana, I also like you to respond to the uh, comments made by Mr. Raw. I mean, saying that there's little we can do considering the fact that, yes, the law says that we are supposed to discipline, but we lack where, the way we are to carry out our function. <clears throat> what, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the Police Service Commission, uh, I mean, talking from personal experience, there is no time we we'll sent a petition to the Police Service Commission and we we'll follow up uh, that we haven't really had some kind of response. Uh, whether you are satisfied or not is another matter entirely. Uh, what we have done with respect to funding of the police, we campaign, and there is now a law, uh, what we call Police um, uh, Trust Fund Act of 2019 which has provided that the 0.5% of the entire money in the federation account, 0.005% of uh, the profits of companies in Nigeria will be paid into the police trust fund for buying equipment and providing accommodation for police personnel in Nigeria, as usual. The law has been bogged down. I mean, the law has not been allowed to function. I think it was only last week that the National Assembly passed the budget uh, of uh, the police with a view to releasing part of that money to carry out uh, necessary, uh, 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 in line with the provisions of that law, to make provision for the police. So the point I'm making, therefore, is that very soon I will expect that the Police Service Commission will be funded to address the question of discipline 
uh, uh, police personnel all over the country. But what is currently done is that uh, at the level of the states, the commissioners of police are allowed to engage in what they call oddly room trials of police personnel before such matters are referred to the police service commission. In the case of Lagos, with respect to the allegations of human rights infringement that occurred on Saturday, the commissioner of police had already, has already set up an inquiry to investigate the officers, uh, the any officers. Again, this is where the police service commission has not even lifted a finger, but the commissioner of police has already uh, uh, instituted an inquiry to ensure that all the officers involved are brought to book. If in discipline them, the police command in Lagos has cause to refer to the police service commission, that will be done. But the point I'm making is that there is already a decentralization of uh, police discipline in Nigeria. Because there are cases that are upheld, uh, uh, verdicts handed down in the room, you know, through the room trials by the police in the respective states. So to that extent, we do not have to go to Abuja for every any police officer in uh, Agege or Makoko or Ajegule, you can be running to Abuja for every derelict on the part of police personnel. So that is the position as of today. Okay, uh, Mr. Farano, thank you. Let me thank you very much, Mr. Farano. I'm, I'm going to ask you the last question, but before I do that, I think uh, Mr. Mom wanted to respond to the uh, answers given by uh, Rinu. Please, Mr. Mom, go ahead, please. Yeah, th thank you so much. And, and, and thank Renu and uh, Falana ASN for the take in which they have brought in here. You see, like there is an oversight mechanism that's external and also internal. Internal lies with the police, which is what Mr. Falana ASN is talking about here. We are the police themselves try to uh, 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 carry out investigations and at the end of it all, uh, send the, re the, re the recommendations to the Police Service Commission to react. But all I'm saying is this, and I hope I wasn't misunderstood. All I'm saying is that in as much as the Police Service Commission would want to act, how, for example, can you leave Lagos as the SAN had just stated and come to Abuja to make a report? If the Police Service Commission had an office in Lagos, that would make things a whole lot much easy. But because of some of the uh, uh, challenges the Police Service Commission has, what the Commission has done is this. It has, de it has delegated its powers of discipline from constables to inspectors that, mm -hmm. and given those powers to the IG, mm -hmm. who has in turn empowered the commissioners of police to react to issues of indiscipline against the rank and file. That is constables to inspectors. But when it comes to senior officers from assistant superintendents to the deputy inspector generals of police, that lies with the commission. All I'm saying is, why don't we look at these gaps and empower? Why don't we look at these gaps and, 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 and try to respond to them so that we have a truly national agency or national commission that can be all across Nigeria and power to carry investigations so that we do not have to come back to this NSAS thing all over again. As long as there is no detail, stiff uh, 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 monitoring or accountability in place with regard to un unprofessional conduct, the motivation will be for it to continue. And except we take seriously the issue of oversight function, then we haven't started. And I hope Fallon and SAN is is listening because these are persons who have a voice in the society and we must take this issue of oversight mechanism very seriously otherwise god forbid we will come back to this circle again to discuss answers i uh, thank you very much mr mom and uh, mr falano i'm going to ask you now to respond to the question whether you're going to also go to court over this matter because 
already you have won several cases on this matter. What what is the next thing to do? Because the court has ruled that the right of protest is guaranteed by our constitution and by several other extant law. What is the next thing to do? What are you planning to do? So one of So we Mr. Femi Falano, my question is to you now. Did you hear me? Hello? Mr. Femi Falano, do you hear the question? Yes, I mean, huh? so, yes, what can I do for you? Yes, I'm asking you now. You've been to court, you have won cases. The law is established that the right of Nigeria to protest is guaranteed, and you have espoused that in your conversation with us now. And I'm now saying, with regards to the protest on Saturday, what is the next thing to do? What do you plan to do? I already have instructions, uh, at least from a couple of uh, the protesters, to approach the court for legal redress. And we are going to do that next week. Uh, uh, also, with respect to ESA's protesters whose sarcans were frozen by the central bank, uh, that is also going to court. I mean, these cases are meant to ask for reparation for the victims of injustice and human rights infringement in our country. Uh, so that uh, those cases will serve as a deterrent, you know, and help to expand the democratic space until we're able to win our lives and get the government of Lagos State and the police, as well as others, to appreciate the need for us to sit down and work out the mechanism for allowing people to enjoy their right to protest. That, that's what, that's the essence of the cases we are going to find. Yeah. Thank you very much. And Renu, you, I need to find out from you, what do you think Nigerian youth should take away from this protest? What, uh, what do you intend to gain? I'm putting a question to Teorino now. Yeah. I didn't I didn't get that question very clearly. My question to you, Rino, is that having realized what has been happening to several protesters in the last few months, since October last year, I'm asking you, what is a takeaway for Nigerian youth in all these uh, protests and arrests and dehumanization and violations of the law? Honestly, I think that um the more Nigerian youth rights have been, uh, they have been deprived, the more Nigerian youth have been deprived of their rights, the more they are being beaten, the more they are, they are being thrown into cells. I think their resolve just gets stronger every day. I mean, with the happening of October 2020, you would have hardly imagined that you would see any Nigerian youth that would say, oh, I want to come out and carry placards again to say I'm protesting. But look at, Last week, Saturday, so many of them came out to say, yes, we're still standing. That is the true essence of democracy. These people are not getting tired anytime, any day. And that is what the Nigerian government needs to understand. That there's a generation of resilient people. There's a generation that is willing to stand up for themselves and for the generation that is yet to come. These people are not getting tired any soon. So the Nigerian government better sit right and know its priorities. Is it to send office police officers to go and um, do a show of force at the Lekki toll gate or to handle the issues of insecurity in the country. That's what the Nigerian government know. But these youths that you are seeing out there, these youths that they call themselves the Sorosuke generation, they're not getting tired anytime soon. We're tired of the status quo. Enough is enough. Enough is enough of profiling people, arresting people unjustly, killing people extrajudicially, especially youths. So we're tired. And... I mean, the takeaway is we're not, we're not getting tired anytime soon. We're not even tired because we're seeing through every facade that this government is putting across. We're seeing through every mask. We're seeing that everything they're just doing right now to seem to appease the just to for missing action. They're not really doing anything much. They just want to do something for the media to see, oh, we're doing, oh, they asked for a panel. We gave them now. Meanwhile, you're not doing the, the, the barest minimum to make sure that the panels work. Look at an Anamba panel. It has not been working, and the government refused to fund them. Look at Enugu panel. The same thing happened there. And this is, and this is a government that, that told the entire world that we're willing to listen to the demands of this. 
Protesters that report that protesters from October are still in cells, yet to be released. Meanwhile, the first demand on the 5 for 5 was an immediate release of all protesters, yet that has not been done. So what, what is, why is the Nigerian government making it look as if its youths are the demons, its youths are, are the terrorists? Meanwhile, the actual terrorists are there. We're seeing you negotiating with bandits. We're seeing you negotiating with, they, this, we're not stupid people. So we've seen all this, and, and I'm sure that, I, I, I'm very, very sure that I'm not, I'm not just speaking out of sentiment. This is um, a general outcall, this is a general call to the Nigerian government to sit right and know its priorities, to know that the youth of this nation are the soul of the nation. If you kill all of us today, who are going to be the leaders of tomorrow? That's the last. Thank you very, very much, Bruno. Mr. Mom, I would like you to also give your final word before we end this conversation. Mr. Mom, go for it. Uh, thank you very much. I think that uh, there are positives from the NSAS protest. Um, and uh, it's, it's that not all been, uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, negatives. Uh, we've seen that our nation can function uh, from the microzim, so to speak, of what came out at NSAS. You had to, you know, applaud the way it was organized, at least in the early stages, where you had water, you had food, you had finance, ambulances, and all of that. That is how a country can, should function. And, you know, so the young men, the youth came, showed us what it means to be effective and efficient, even without, uh, 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 even in, a, in, a, in an environment that is very inefficient. And so for me, we need to, you know, give that space to the youth to come out, young persons, um, uh, understand them, try to, you know, engage and, 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 and use their knowledge so that this country can benefit from. I think for me, what I saw, what the youth could do during NSAS was um, humbling. And I, I, I regret that, um, and it's unfortunate that it ended the way it did when it degenerated into uh, some sort of um, violence where we saw public property being looted and, and burned and all of that, police of police posts being burnt and uh, killed, police officers being killed and, and all of that. But you have to give it to the youth that the first two weeks before it was hijacked was perfect. It's what we want to see and we hope we can borrow from that and learn from that. And to you, Mr. Falano, please, I would also like, not, like you to also give your final word on this. Well, my final word is that uh, uh, Nigerians should be encouraged, we're not just talking of the youths. Uh, Nigerians should be encouraged to learn to defend their rights and what we are going to do on the part of the human rights community is to try and make available the existing laws on the rights of Ni basic rights of Nigerians so that Nigerians can be empowered and be motivated to defend their rights at all times. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Femi Falano, SAN, and lawyers and human rights activists. We also thank you, uh, Reno Duala, NSAS protester and activist, and also the Commissioner Human Rights Police and Service Commission, uh, Mr. Romy Moore. Thank, thank you very much. I wanted to be on record that we also reach out to Mr. Oluwiwa Dejobi, uh, the public, uh, Police Public Relations Officer at Lagos State Police Command. And, uh, we expected that it was going to be part of this conversation. But towards the end of the, uh, by the time we get to five o'clock, we realize that he will not be able to make it again. And so we apologize uh, for his absence, despite the fact that we have announced that he's going to be part of this uh, conversation. I thank you everyone, and I thank Nigeria. Thank you everyone. <laughs>